So my name's Jeff Gray, CEO and co-founder. We have Mike Howe, our Director of Technical Marketing, and Olivier Wynn Van, our CTO and co-founder. So let's get started. First of all, this is the agenda. Uh, I will give a brief overview. I promise it'll be pretty short, and then I'll get out of the way and let the smart folks take over. We're gonna go through a few use cases, about five use cases, and feel free to ask questions throughout. Uh, we look forward to answering everything live. If it pops in your mind, just feel free to ask, and we'll jump right into it. So with that, uh, once again, my name is Jeff Gray, CEO and co-founder of Glueware, and uh, let's jump in. So at the highest level, uh, our vision is to make network automation simple. And our mission is to simplify networking by delivering the best multi-vendor packaged enterprise automation solutions in the market. And to our knowledge, uh, no company out there has delivered packaged automation before, packaged monitoring, yes, and have done great, but everything, as far as we can tell, is build your own and DIY. And so we want to really deliver package solutions that help enterprises get to an automated state without having to build everything from scratch. And so when we look at the market, this is our view, uh, feel free to interject, but when you look at the functionality in automated access, as well as time, what we're seeing is that there are many enterprises that really don't have automation, that they're doing everything box by box, logging in to devices, pushing changes, or template-based, what we call load and pray, so you know, have a file, fill in wildcard, send it down to a networking device, reboot it, and hope for the best. When we're looking at a lot of the vendor tools, there have been some big announcements lately, but they're really not there yet. It is still very template-based. Uh, many networking vendors' uh, solutions have actually been end of life, or will be end of life soon, and they're looking to move in the right direction to intent-based automation. And so we fully believe in where a lot of companies are looking to go, but it's mostly for their own equipment. And there is absolutely a gap there. From what we're hearing from our customers, it's two, three plus years, and they're looking for a solution right now. And so a lot of customers have been looking to Python scripting, you know, other types of scripting, and they're getting really excited about it, writing good scripts, and they like the result of what those scripts do. But from what they're telling us, they're just scratching the surface in terms of what they can do, that it is a very tall order to move from a manual state, starting to do some Python scripting, move into a full-blown automated state. I mean, that's really the equivalent of building a software company inside every single enterprise. And so for the web scale companies out there, the Facebooks, the Googles of the world, absolutely, some of the top investment banks have done it. But for every single enterprise out there and the mass market, it's a tall order. There's a big skill gap. Uh, there's retraining staff to learn you know, about software. There's uh, just a lot to do to be able to either create unicorns that know both network engineering and uh, coding, or to have these groups work together and to build their own. And so we're not saying it's impossible. There are absolutely companies that want to do that. We're just saying that there could be an easier way. And that's why, at this point, we have created Glueware, which is a model-driven multi-vendor automation platform with a variety of apps. And so rather than having uh, customers try to build their own and DIY you know, with some open source and a lot of elbow grease, our customers have said, if you could provide us apps that allow us just to jump in and solve a certain use case and provide a high level of functionality with growing functionality over time, that is extremely interesting. And so we spent a long time developing this platform and these solutions that the, part of the benefits is that you can actually ingest what you have. You can bring your own architecture, you can go out, discover the network, be able to pull it in. I'm gonna double click on that in a moment. But the beauty is that you can actually automate what's there. And there's a lot of advanced features. So if you think of scripting, right, is much more static, it's much more just rolling out and doing something. Whereas if you have model driven, you define your model and then the platform can make sure that it goes down and creates that network in the in intended state that you want it to be in. And so that's our view of the market. Uh, you know, feel free to poke holes in it or whatever you want, but this is the way that we're viewing the market based on what customers have told us. And so if we look at Glueware, you know, what I wanted to do today was not just give you like a marketing slide and throw some claims out and things like that. We really thought about, okay, what's different with Glueware? What is only with Glueware, uh, you know, that, that folks could achieve? And so I talked about the brownfield automation piece. What we wanted to do is to create a layer of software that abstracts away all the complexity 
so that you can automate whatever is there. And so our view is to be able to enforce policy on any brownfield multi-vendor environment, be able to pull network state and have this closed loop intent-based capability, but start out with very specific use cases, which we'll go through in a moment, and then get to a more autonomic state over time. And so the three things that I want to leave you with besides the marketing piece, the smarter, faster, simpler, is that it is model driven, that you define your model and your intended state, and then the platform is able to go down and have a two-way conversation to validate the exact state. So we can actually not only write things, you know, we can read things, we can pull things off, we can write, reapply things, you'll see that in the Quas demo, and there's a lot of intelligence that's built in. It's not left specifically to the network engineer or developer to try to create the best script that they can, there's a semantic and syntax engine for every single vendor operating system, and so we'll go into that and demonstrate that on the fly. The other one is rapid uh, brownfield onboarding. We're not saying that you have to reinvent your architecture, that you can take what you have, you can preserve all the network engineering that's been out there, that's been built up over many years, and you can actually in ingest that and import that into the platform, and we'll, we'll show you that as well. And so that means that you know, all the folks that are way smarter than us, all the network engineers, you know, that know their architectures, they can actually automate that exact architecture without needing to redeploy. And then the final piece is that we're delivering apps, right, not coding or playbooks. And so, you know, a couple years ago, we did allow for customers to develop their own, and, you know, over time, we'll get back to that, but they've told us that they really just kind of want to jump in the car and drive it. They don't want to build the car from scratch. And so our apps are specifically designed to you know, help with the use cases that they've asked us that they need help with. And to double click on that, we play in three specific areas. So network configuration automation, two security and compliance, and three change management and cost avoidance. And so on the network configuration automation, being able to automate rollouts. So zero touch deployment, even on brownfield devices, being able to reuse devices, you don't have to buy new hardware to get zero touch provisioning. Uh, part of the model driven piece is reducing risk. So the network engineering team or the architects can leverage or design their model and then abstract away and actually hide a lot of the nerd knobs from the operations teams and push out workflows. So we're kind of breaking that oxymoron of both customizable as well as prescriptive that you can you know, automate what you have and then be able to make it prescriptive for the operations teams. And so security and compliance, uh, being able to accelerate audits, there's a lot of you know, companies that are struggling with compliance and assurance and audits. And so our Config Drift app really helps with that. Uh, there's been you know, a ton of P-certs, a lot of security advisories on operating systems. So multi-vendor operating system pushes and being able to do this in, in an intelligent manner at scale. So that's another thing that, that we're doing. And then auto remediation, we have both agents as well as agent less and you can actually schedule enforcing a policy and then config drift. So it's actually this closed loop capability on a scheduled basis. So we have got there, it took a while, but we have that now. And then change management cost avoidance. So CICD continuous delivery. So we have a northbound RESTful API, which Olivier will demonstrate, whereby you, know, you don't even have to use our GUI. You can make pushes directly to Glueware and just use it as an execution engine with that intelligence. Um, we can share that a little bit. Safe and predictable because it's model driven. Uh, and then being able to spread changes quickly, we're up to about, in our, at least in our scale testing, about 14,000 uh, node provisionings per hour now. And I believe that we can continue to add many more as we scale uh, engines, so we can share more on that. Uh, actually, one more thing, uh, we're up to 18 operating system uh, vendor OSs, and we can add these very quickly, not because it's easy, but because there's a lot of IP, uh, intellectual property that Gluer has created, where we can go in, and do a discovery, understand all the syntax and semantics and rapidly onboard you know, that feature. So you design your model, then Gluer will talk, you know, English to uh, Juniper, French to Cisco, you know, German to Riverbed, et cetera, right? And so that's the way it works. So, so a quick question. Yeah, sure, correct. That, I mean, a lot of people are very attached to their Python and their Ansible. They're not gonna be able to do this easily. Right. The second part of it is though, I can still strap my Python and Ansible on top of your platform to extract value? That's very possible. So if you have you know, libraries that you've built and then you want to be able to make REST calls or push JSON down to Glueware, you can absolutely do that. Yeah, so I think uh, this is like an 80-20 rule. Glueware could give you 80% of what you need, but you still might want, a lot of people won't, I bet, but you still might want to do 20% of customization for your 
snowflake networking system that you theoretically might have. I agree with that. Mm. And, and I think that, you know, it'll be a toss up if they want to keep Python. I mean, maybe they will maybe. and just make calls. That's fine. Right. Uh, as we uh, open up Blue Air again mm. to folks, uh, it's extremely efficient in terms of making customizations. So instead of Python being like, say, 80 lines or so, you know, for one line of CLI abstracted, we're like one line for one line fully abstracted. So I think it's going to be fun to reintroduce that into the market. But if you want to stick with Python, you have those libraries, no problem. Yeah, thanks. I, I have a question before sure. you move on there. Um, you focus a lot on Brownfield, which I think is a great point. Like, it's, you know, <laughs> automating from a greenfield environment's much easier than taking in and bringing in something that you've done previously and, and adding orchestration to it. My question on that, though, is that, you know, we're learning as we go along here that for automation and orchestration to happen well, it needs to be a, you know, a well thought out modular design. And I think ingesting a lot of brownfield environments are not going to be that. Are you helping in any way get from a non-modular design to a modular design so you can automate and orchestrate easier? Beautiful question. And uh, the way we like to say is that the bigger the mess, the more we shine. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, the more nodes, the more, frankly, dysfunction out there, the more, you know, heterogeneity out there, the more like, you know, it's not a golden config, um, we can really help. And the way that we help, which we're gonna show, is that we can go out with our config drift app and be able to understand you know, exactly the state of the network, especially on the configurations and, and you know, all of the uh, ver variations between them. And then you can start to break it up. You can say, I want to start just with SNMP and create that as a standard way and go out and enforce SNMP. And that could just be one thing, right? And that on its own provides value to start the standardization process. And then quas, right? The use case I'm going to show in a moment is just about quas. And that created a lot of value. So, you don't have to boil the ocean, I guess is my point, that you can start out to you know, create much more of a common environment and then set the stage for Greenfield. And the, the, the nice thing is that once you have you know, a nice uh, network instead of the Wild West, right, that it makes it much easier to deploy Greenfield because then you can start to pull out old devices and plug in new and it can auto-configure. And so, I, I mean, it's a great question and uh, that's actually where you know, we're really helping the most, I would say. I have one other question too, sure. mainly just because of one name that's up on that list, specifically the Teller, which is already an orchestrated system. So like, how does that interaction point happen? I mean, we've already have, you know, obviously they're automating and orchestrating right. a, a WAN deployment. Are you then sitting over the top? Like, <laughs> would someone with your product not ever touch the Vitella dashboard? Or like, what's the, how does that work? So uh, the, the, first of all, we built a Viptela adapter, right? So we built uh, the, the config drift so that we can pull state and also be able to push policy. Um, Viptela has not been released into iOS XE yet in, mm -hmm. in mass, so we need to see how that, that goes. Now, as it is rolled into iOS XE and it's a variety of features, you know, for us, it's just very simple. It's three, four extra features on top of Cisco. With uh, Viptela and their orchestrated system, my understanding is it works great for, you know, the Viptela feature sets, but all the 20 years prior to Cisco and all the legacy features, all the brownfield, you know, doesn't really have that, right? It was built for Viptela. So our story is that, uh, you know, we're about automating brownfield, and then what customers intend to use this for is upgrading operating systems, right, in an automated manner to push the iOS XE, and then turning on the Viptela feature sets on top of that. Now, how the control plane works, and you know, if you need to, you know, goes back and sets the control plane up, you know, and whether we're going to make calls via our REST DK, right, directly to Viptela and, and push changes there, or we go CLI, you know, that remains to be seen. But we know that we can do it, especially since we are we've already done it on Viptela standalone. And then over time, you know, we just believe that it's a few extra features that we'll turn on and be able to automate for day two. Okay. Yeah. Um, question. So sure. some of these vendors like firewalls and Riverbed, they would have very specific configuration on URL whitelisting, application optimization, and also is all that supported as well, or not that granular level of configuration is supported? It, it's you know, that's a great question, and it really depends, right? <clears throat> um, we're not a complete replacement for every single you know vendor management or monitoring tool, right? They're always going to have a little bit extra right. special sauce. We like to call it belt and suspenders. That if you're looking for you know one platform to be able to manage policy across WAN, LAN, data center, et cetera, and multi-vendor, 
that we can do a great job. Now, if there are specific monitoring features or additional features on a per vendor basis, you can still use those vendor management tools, right, if they serve a specific purpose. Glue networks used to manage everything or nothing, right? Now we can just manage you know, a little bit or as much as you want, we leave that up to you, and it can coexist and play nicely in the sandbox with others. Do you have any integrations into those vendor tools? Uh, actually, we're gonna show uh, a little a little bit. Uh, it's more actually API based to you know vendor management for like P certs and end of life and things like that. Um, we can certainly do that if they have a RESTful API or can make calls to us or a monitoring system can pass alerts to us and then we can make trigger change. Yeah. So with these brownfield deployments, I mean we all have seen ACLs for instance where half the stuff in there is completely irrelevant just because they've continued to upgrade. Does Glueware do anything to optimize the configuration or does it basically pull the same stuff in and then automate it? Uh, it, it we leave that up to the customer, right? We just had a customer uh, that pushed Quas and they had a variety of ACLs still for like Kazaa, right? I mean, that was a long time ago, right? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and, and so, you know, they said, eh, we're gonna get rid of that, right? But we really leave it up to the network engineering team and if they wanna leave all the stuff in, they can. If they want to compress and modernize it and then be able to go through and say, okay, we don't want that anymore and clean it up, then it's certainly possible. Right, so we want to pull in clean configs. It's not going to do anything to optimize. So clean up the configs first and then. Yeah, I, I would say that you, could, you can pull it in and then you can start you know, to say, okay, I just want to clean you know, this portion of, of it and then we can go and enforce that policy. But you know, there's no like auto magic, like you just push a button and it auto, you know, auto cleans everything. We really leave that in the hands of the network engineering team, so. And one other question, you yeah. uh, mentioned model driven several times, yes. and that's one of those buzzwords that could mean different things to different people. So can you expand on that? Absolutely, and in fact, I had intent based, but I took that off, so. <laughs> <laughs> Another buzzword. <laughs> right. So model driven, uh, we've created our own modeling framework, and mm -hmm. it's not based on Yang, it's not based, you know, there's no compiling required, right? You know, we, we, in enterprise land, our, our view is that you want something extremely flexible uh, so that you allow the network engineering team to be able to make changes quickly and just push it into production. Instead of having to build everything up and build Yang models and everything and then, you know, compile it and then push a large, you know, a, a you know, much larger code base. So when we say model driven, um, it's a referential uh, and hierarchical framework, and you'll see us being able to drop in, I mean, CLI. So we're actually training the engineering team. You know, they're actually coding without knowing they're coding. They're like dropping in, you know, CLI in a modular fashion, and it's actually coding for them without them actually, you know, scripting Python. And so that's what we mean by model driven. And then, it allows that model, you know, the engine goes down and has a two-way dialogue, and it's hard to show this like on a slide or whatever, but it is absolutely like having a conversation and you know, a lot of acknowledgement back and forth, and it's more like a heat-seeking missile, right? You have validation that you know that that network's now in its intended state. So. I have another one. Sorry, probably we're cutting corners. You're, okay. <laughs> you had some uh, plans for this, and uh, Rita correctly said that, mentioned the word that, uh, the fact that model means different things to different people. And I wanted to ask something about uh, another plane of modeling. Um, I guess that in this room we all tried or did some network automation before, and I, I really believe that automating the network is the easy part. Um, the really complicated part is to build a model of the network itself, and network, as the word suggests, is a, is a, is a set of elements that have relationship between each other, and. Uh, especially if you work in brownfield, that's super challenging. So I was really interested in, how, in understanding how you do it. So I, I think if, if it's okay, I think that we should address that in the demos yeah. mm -hmm. because I think the product's gonna speak a lot more loudly than I will on this topic, but I mean, I fully concur and that's kind of like our whole you know, business, if you will, right? Tackle on a very hard problem. Do you, can we show you live? Oh, absolutely. Okay, super. Real quick question before yep. we move on to that on the vendor list. How long does it take to onboard that, and how, is that, how does that work with your customers to onboard a new, a new vendor, a new OS? Sure. Uh, so it really depends on the vendor. I can say we did checkpoint in two hours. Oh, wow. Okay. Right. Uh, A10 was four hours. Uh, checkpoint was our fastest mm -hmm. so far, I believe. And it's because of the IP of the discovery engine going in and being mm -hmm. able to kind of auto-discover all the capabilities and 
you know, pull that into the engine so it can talk that language. Um, and uh, so it can be fast, or it can be longer, right? If there's a big feature set, you know, it'll take longer. Now, that was, the two hours was just the semantic engine, the vendor adapter. And then you also have to be able to, you know, ingest uh, the configurations. But if you build out the hierarchical model, then, you know, it's really simple. Um, you gotcha. know, it can be, if the architecture's built, it's like fat, like instant. Yeah. And is that considered like a customization and you're, you know, you work with some software shops and they're like, oh, this is custom, we've got to do this custom, or is that just part of the product that you part of the product. Can, can digest that and integrate that in and take it in a new OS? That was really kind of the special sauce, right? Because we can never bake a business on custom engineering. We'd just be constantly running on the treadmill. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of building the vendor adapter and then enabling the network engineers to put in their custom architectures. Gotcha. Yep. So ballpark, how many vendors, vendor integrations are you currently supporting? Uh, right now, it's 18 uh, vendor operating systems and growing. Uh, you know, and I, I don't know what the limit will be on that. We'll just keep going, right? It's very customer driven. Um, and if customer pays us, uh, you know, some money, then we go and build that. And then we say, okay, now you can put your models in. Yep. How much of the uh, market do you think you cover already with your 18? Who? It's pretty broad, I would say. Yeah, it looks, looks yeah. to be pretty for, big for enterprise. <laughs> Yeah, for enterprise, we're purposely staying away from service providers um, at this point. And but for enterprise land, these are the main uh, these are the main ones we think. So I'm going to speed up here because uh, I think we're you know little little over time. But uh, Gluer Control is like the mothership, if you will, the orchestrator and controller. That's at the highest level. Um, you can have a control engine, and you can have as many engine servers as you want for scale. So extremely high scale. Uh, we manage our own queues and, and things like that. Uh, so that's the controller orchestrator. Then we have config modeling, which uh, I, I spoke about, which is being able to ingest the configs and then enforce policy down to the node. And then config drift for you know, audit and compliance assurance. And then you can have scheduled, so you know, closed loop, if you will, being able to look at config and then being able to push state. And then OS upgrade uh, for patching devices at scale and dealing with P-certs and, and things like that. And so, you know, it's one platform to be able to force policy, check policy, push operating systems, uh, multi-vendor, and just try to make it easy. And so I'm gonna give you one example, and this is a global pharma, and they have a 440 node uh, global BGP MPLS network. Now, full disclosure, we were in like an IWAN deployment, and then, you know, Viptelo was purchased, and everything kind of stopped for a little while, but they had a, uh, a, a need to go out and roll Microsoft OneDrive and be able to change quads across their network. And they have an outsourcer, they pay two hundred twenty to $250,000 every time this outsourcer goes and touches the network, especially for quads, and it takes six to nine months, and it was just manual, right? And they couldn't wait six to nine months. So they were already playing with Glueware, and we delivered this solution, so all three of those apps that I just shared, and the net result is that they're actually able to change quads on their production network literally in minutes. Mm -hmm. Now, the ops team kind of freaked out and said, you know, we can't do this in minutes, we gotta break it up over two evenings, but they did it over two evenings, and it just took a few hours. And so, you know, huge excitement, in fact, it looks like they're gonna be a public reference soon, and uh, they also automated many other features, so SNMP, you know, AAA, NetFlow, all kinds of other features, you know, to get things under control as, uh, as, as was asked, uh, push OS upgrades at scale. Now we're moving forward with a 15,000 uh, node uh, deployment. And then uh, if they looked at their outsourcers' costs, and they're not paying this, but their outsourcers' costs, including the cost of Glueware, we're looking at about $33 million in cost avoidance, right? It's not, that's not the actual outlay over five years because they're not paying that. But if they were going to pay their current bill, then that's what it would be. And so huge success, uh, really proud of this quote, um, you know, from the, the main, you know, one of the main flag carriers that's been rolling out. So I know I've gone over time. Thank you very much for the questions. Looking forward to jumping into the demo. I see one more. I have one question. Okay. So the, the, the take six to nine months with errors, that sticks out to me. Yep. Does Glueware, does a controller do configuration verification like you're doing quas wrong before it deploys out to I know there's some subjectivity to that, like ports and whatnot, but um, does, can it, does, does it do <coughs> configuration? We're actually going to do a quas demo. We'll show that in the demo. Mm -hmm. okay. But essentially, there's, there's validation that takes place. 
and then, but ultimately a designer is putting in the quas policy that they want so that you, we don't skip the testing phase, right? You validate your quas, okay. then you essentially have taught our orchestration engine how to implement it, and so it will validate it, right? So if someone were to mess up the, the CLI, there could, be, there could be a validation error which would prevent the provisioning, right? Okay. So there are numerous levels of validation checks that occur in the platform, but it is, um, you know, there, there's a kind of a policy side, right, which is the, it, are, am I checking or applying any rules to what you're doing? Right. And that, there is a certain amount of it already there, but the, most of it is based on the assumption that you're providing the, the proper model of config that you want deployed. And there's also a preview mode which we'll, sh we'll share, okay. so it actually previews everything before you go to make sure there's no errors or it'll work. Sure. Um, you know, we're not doing, you know, we're not training everyone how to do quas perfectly, but we do have referential models that you can leverage if you want. So, you know, there is that element. Okay. Um, but the, you know, the auto magic, like, hey, we could just fix your quas and, you know, we're, there's still network engineering and like that knowledge involved. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, would, I, I guess I look at it from a, a standpoint, and maybe Quas isn't the best example, but uh, maybe if you were uh, altering a trunk port or something and you uh, were taking out, say, the, VLAN. you know, your management VLAN and then all of a sudden you're, you, you know, you're trunking a bunch of VLANs through and you change the configuration via Glueware, Glueware, will Glueware know, hey, this is your management VLAN, you're not gonna wanna take that out of the trunk. And, and back to, uh, yeah, in the design. We may right. be going too yeah. deep into so, the needs here. So, so this is important because, you know, we're, our kind of premise is like leverage your own CLI and really no coding. But, the, but in the platform there are uh, capabilities or policies where um, we could discover things on the interface and only apply changes to an access port or only apply, we'll discover it is a trunk port. So we can discover it based on a, a, a label, on a description. We can discover it based on a VLAN. So you're setting your policy, and in fact, we're doing a switch demo applying NAC a little bit later, and you'll see how we discover and then only apply, in that case, uh, making, you know, applying 802.1x to access ports only, right? So yes, the engine has the ability to discover and, uh, and and only touch certain port or ports or trunks that you've defined. Sure. Absolutely. Okay.